Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and you have clicked play on. <clears throat> we hope you've clicked subscribe to a podcast that deals in what we call crucible experiences. If you're not sure what crucible experiences are, maybe that maybe this is the first time you're with us and you've never heard that term before. We call crucible experiences, that's the name we give to things, traumas, tragedies, setbacks, failures, those things that happen in life either to you or in some part caused by you that can feel like it knocks you off your feet, that can feel like they knock the wind out of your sails, that very, in a very real way can change the trajectory of your life. But here's the good news about why we talk about them. It's not so that we can sit around and build a virtual campfire and trade war stories about how bad our lives are. We talk about them to help you overcome them, to help us who've also been through them to overcome them, to find hope and healing on the other side of moving, as the show says, beyond your crucible. And the creator of all this and the host of the show uh, is here with us, that's Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, welcome. Thanks, Gary. Uh, very much looking forward to it. So we've got uh, a very interesting episode today, and I like it not only because of the content of what our guest's going to bring, but I'll say this, Warwick. Uh, our guest and, and, and I both have lived in the same state, Colorado, um, and he's not Australian. So I'm, I'm catching up. It's no longer Wisconsin <laughs> versus Australia. Now we've got Colorado versus Australia, but at least we've got, I've got some kinship uh, on that front with our guest. And that guest is Jeff Caliguire, who is a transformational coach and founder and president of We Train Coaches, a program that trains coaches who transform lives and build thriving businesses. He's been practicing transformational coaching professionally since 2001 and certifying transformational coaches since 2017. He is co-founder of Soul Care with Mindy Caliguire. I'm thinking they might be related. Uh, <laughs> he is the, the author of eight published books, including The Habits of Hope, which if you're listening on YouTube with us is right here. Um, and Transformational Coaching is another uh, one of his books. Jeff is the former senior pastor and president of a nonprofit in Boston. After struggling with burnout and depression, Jeff discovered coaching as a tool to help him build a life he loved. In doing so, he found his calling and passion for helping others care for their souls and live out all that God has for them through real transformation. He's a graduate of Cornell University and Dallas Theological Seminary. He's been married to Mindy for 33 years, has three adult sons, lives in Louisville, Colorado, and is the co-creator with Mindy of the Whisper Ranch in Boulder, Colorado. It's a lot of Colorado, Warwick. No Australia. <laughs> Take so it away. Good. Yeah, Colorado is a great place. It's funny. We were there about couple of weeks ago in a steamboat, funnily enough, uh, my wife and boys and uh, daughter, they love skiing. I didn't grow up skiing in Australia, but you know that was part of the marriage contract when we got married. <laughs> pretty much around when you did, maybe 32 years ago, whenever it was. So uh, yeah, Colorado is a wonderful place. But uh, Jeff, thanks so much for being here. And um, I love what you do with We Train Coaches and your concept about... Um, you know, transformation through coaching. But I'd like to kind of go back a bit, as we often say here on Beyond the Crucible, to get a bit of the origin story of how you grew up. I think you mentioned uh, before you grew up maybe in the New York area and um, your dad maybe was a business owner, chief executive of a paper company. So talk about, you know, growing up in New York and <clears throat> maybe family expectations. And obviously, as listeners know, I have some understanding of the whole growing up in a family <laughs> business deal, growing up in a large family media business in Australia. So, yeah, just talk about growing up and expectations and what's the path you thought you were on. or Maybe your parents or your dad was thinking you should be on, perhaps. Yeah, my dad, my dad was a guy who grew up in the Great Depression, you know, actually sold newspapers on the streets of mm. Boston 
And he truly was, I mean, if there's ever a self-made man, I know we're all made, you know, in a lot of ways by each other. But my dad was somebody who was, you know, single mom, alcoholic dad. And he went into business in New York, started out just selling, eventually was able to buy the company. And uh, I don't think I realized how, how amazing my dad was until later I went through my own leadership issues and started to think, wow, my dad actually knew something. You know how you think your dad doesn't know much. <laughs> but I was the youngest of three <laughs> sons. And my dad really had hoped that one of his sons was going to go into the family business. And so there was this unspoken pressure. And I worked there during the summers in New York. You know, you get to go into the family business. And I just didn't say this to my dad was, do I really want to go into the family business? Is this, is this something for me? I mean, I didn't come from the Great Depression. My life was a lot different. So, you know, it's that unwritten, unspoken expectation that made me go, okay, then what? if I don't go into the family business. Yeah, boy, I know it so well. So when you say a paper business, just out of curiosity, what kind of paper, was it newsprint or you know, what kind of paper product was it? And most people will get it instantly when I say think the office. It was, it <laughs> ah, was, okay. it was basically- Dunder Mifflin. <laughs> it was Dunder Mifflin, instead it was called Wilman and it was in New York City. We sold paper to, printers and publishers, big roles. So that, that my dad was an amazing salesperson sold to American Express and Time Warner and, <laughs> you know, just, just had amazing success in the Dunder Mifflin type of business. Wow. And you use a phrase that this unspoken expectation, I mean, I, I can so identify with it, you know, as listeners know, I was grew up in a fifth generation family business. Uh, my dad inherited as he as his grandfather did, and yeah, I had as listeners know, my dad was married three times, my mom twice, and uh, because I got good grades in school and worked hard, and you know, uh, the expectations rose. I was sort of the quote unquote good son. I didn't kind of, I wasn't the prodigal son, if you if you will, that kind of went away and was rebellious. So he never said, well, you know, have you thought about if you're going to the family business? The question was never asked. It was, it was obviously expected that I would prepare myself. Oxford, Wall Street, Harvard Business School. It was, and if I didn't go into it, I felt like it would have just crushed him. So, I maybe took the uh, not so wise path. You probably had enough wisdom, courage, or something to say, I don't know that I want to do this. I, I, I wasn't even willing to go there. Um, I don't know, five generations. I don't know what it was, but. How did you go there? Because you, you went where I didn't and couldn't. So how did you have the courage? Did you have a conversation with your dad? I mean, how did that come up, that kind of, you know, dad, you know, my, that my brothers aren't going to do it, and I'm, I guess you're hoping me as the youngest might, and I'm just not. I mean, what kind of conversation was that? You know, my dad was somebody who I think didn't want to put pressure on me. But at the same time, I could tell when I started going in a different direction, there was a disappointment. But because I'd worked there during the summers, uh, I got to know what it really was like. And I didn't have any uh, false expectations of what it would be like to lead that business or be in that business. And, and I would have people who would take me out to lunch, um, some older people who were part of the business. And they'd say, do you realize the kind of opportunity that you have? And so there was this little bit of guilt that I had, like I have this opportunity and yet I'm not excited about it. And, and, and a question I think a lot of people who've been you know, in family businesses go through is, all right, I can do anything I wanna do with my life, but I really should go into the family business. And so there's this, this tension of I can do anything, but I'm meant for something else. And so then when I felt like, hey, dad, what if I went to seminary? I'm considering that I, I could tell like he just dropped, you know, like there, there was, he wasn't going to say don't do that because it was a God thing to do. But at the same time, I, I, I hated disappointing my dad. I loved my dad. I, you know, so I think there was this disappointment, but at the same time, this acceptance 
Uh, and I remember having lunch with him and telling him I'd like to go to seminary and, and him not saying much, you know, he didn't affirm it, but he didn't <laughs> right. tell me I shouldn't do it either. Now, um, obviously your person of faith was your dad and family, people of faith. You know, yes, definitely, definitely was. Um, I, I saw faith in my dad. My dad would be the guy who, you know, was before he put his suit on, would get down on his knees at the side of his bed and pray before he started mm. the day and when he ended the day, which marked me. I mean, I, I definitely saw that. But I think what happens with a lot of people is I, I, I could almost use the word, big word, like bifurcate. You right. have mm. life and you have business. And the two don't always intersect. And my dad was a man of character and very moral, but I don't feel like, you know, no one ever prayed with him about his business. Uh, and I didn't feel like he had spiritual mentors in his business that understood him. So, um, so I, I think there was a loneliness. It's kind of like, I know this faith thing is supposed to be integrated in business, but it's not. And so I do think there was a separation. Yeah, that's very common. Uh, certainly back then, even today, people say, well, you know, I do my Jesus thing on Sunday, and uh, maybe I go to Bible study, and then I'm at work, I do my work, and there's no sense of, well, Lord, how do you want me to lead? This is your company, what plans do you have? That's, it's an old thought, hopefully it's becoming a, a, a resurrected thought, if you will. So as a person of faith, when you said you want to go to seminary, it's hard for him to say, well, that's wrong. Because, you know, exactly. any, any person of faith counts with Dow, you know, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, one of the foremost evangelical seminaries in the country. How do you say, no, that's wrong? I mean, it's kind of makes it tough. But I mean, you had a lot of courage in having that conversation. And you're right. I mean, because um, you have these thoughts in your mind. Gosh, you know, and your dad, inevitably, you want your legacy to continue. And there's this unspoken sense if future generations go into it, you know, the Caliguan name is preserved and you can't help but think that way. And from your standpoint, it's easy to think, well, gosh, you know, being a chief executive of a paper company like this, the chances of that happening somewhere else may be not, not as high. So all these thoughts go through in your mind, am I giving up an opportunity? What does the Lord want? But anyway, somehow you must have felt peace that your path was to go to seminary? Did you feel like that still small voice that, you know, with all the pros and cons, I just know what the Lord wants me to do? Did you feel that in a sense? Man, it would sound so spiritual work if I just said, <laughs> sure, you know, <laughs> I think I was more, I think I was more confused, you know, I, I uh -huh. knew, I, I'm like my, my own time in college, I did have a spiritual awakening. And I did start to recognize I could have a spiritual influence and impact on people, especially I was in an Ivy League school and people had a lot of questions about spiritual things. And I loved being a bridge to that. But but if I said, you know, boy, there was this clear calling, go to seminary, all the rest. It was more I wanted to do something meaningful with my life. And, you know, in retrospect, my dad was doing something meaningful. I've come to believe that sometimes we think it was more meaningful to go to seminary than it was to be in a president of a company or be in the company. Or uh, we just had a fireman uh, we did an interview with last night. And he's like, well, I'm just doing my job. And we're like, man, I am so grateful that you did your job. You saved our house from burning down. But, uh, but I think for me, one of the things that was like a missing in a lot of my growing up was how do you process what you're really meant to do, what you're gifted to do, what the opportunities are, are open. Uh, Frederick Beekner said the place where God calls is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of us don't haven't taken the time to know where is my deep gladness where is the need? And then how do I bridge that? And so I think seminary for me was a way to almost avoid making the decision. It took me longer to really find my deep gladness and to, to connect that to the, to the world's deep need. And I think there's a lot of peace when that happens. 
Uh, so, I mean, I, I wish I could say I love studying Greek and Hebrew and, <laughs> and theology, but, uh, you know, I, I actually didn't. Uh, there were some people who did, and they were meant for that. And so it took me longer to really find what I was meant to do. Yeah, and we'll get into what you do now in, in a bit. But I think it's often interesting, and I ask the same questions of myself, if somebody, you know, I mean, we're both um, International Coach Federation certified coaches. If somebody, a coach had asked me back then as, and asked you, so why, because I became a believer when I was at Oxford. Um, so, you know, around about the time I was going to the family business, you could have asked me, so what do you think uh, God's heart is? What's your gifting? Uh, what are you passionate about? You know, how do you think God could use it? Really in similar sense that you're saying, and I don't know how I would have answered that. I think I was probably would have been too stubborn and too, in my case, the family business was founded by as strong a businessman for Christ as exists. So that made it seem clear to me what God's plan was. Surely he wants another believer in the family business, right? Um, and the faith has sort of waned a bit over the generations. But um, yeah, I mean, if you had had somebody like yourself ask a 20-something Jeff Caliguire, so what do you love doing? And, you know, what do you think the Lord wants? And ask those great questions. It's unknowable how you would re have responded, right? But it would have been nice to have had that opportunity. I'm sure you've asked yourself those questions, right? Well, and, and sometimes it's your deep pain that leads to your passion. So, I mean, I had a deep right. pain that I didn't have those safe people in my life. Uh, one, one question I like asking in coaching is, hey, what bugs you that doesn't seem to bug other people? And, and what bugs me is that there weren't people who, I mean, you, there's a mentor of mine who said, hey, we, we figured out how to send a man to the moon, but we can't figure out how to help an 18 year old figure out what they should major in in college <laughs> or what, they, what career they should go into. Right. And so it bugs me that there weren't people who could help me in that way. Um, I wish I had a safe person or people who could allow me to process. And, and it, it usually doesn't come like in one question or one afternoon, right. but, but I feel like if there could be people who, who majored in helping people discover their major or who majored in helping people discover a career trajectory that, that can bring together both their experiences with their strengths, with their gifts and have no, no horse in the race. You know, because I mean, my dad, my dad was amazing, but he had a horse in the race. You know what right. I mean? He wanted me in the business. And yeah. so, you know, just having people like that, I think, can can open up so many good things. Uh, so, you know, I guess yeah. I, I guess I would just ask our listener, what bugs you that doesn't seem to bug other people? Could there be a clue there? You know, that's an awesome question. So let's kind of uh move the story along here a little bit. So you obviously had some experiences at uh, Cornell, uh, you, know, you know, fraternities and other, uh, you know, just ministries in different groups. You go to Dallas Theological Seminary, and then you, you start a church in Boston. And if you go to Dallas Theological Seminary, it's logical that you want to become a pastor because that's why you go there, at least in most cases. So you start a church, and in theory, that sounds like what could be wrong with that, right? You're a believer, you start a church, but yet uh, that path was not easy. And I think it led to some crucible moments. Talk a bit about starting that church and why that wasn't easy. And that led to some soul searching. There are certain things that you feel like education can't equip you for. And some of the education that I didn't feel equipped for was the loneliness of leadership and also overcoming, you know, rejection that comes in in pastoral leadership. Uh, I think people look to a pastor to have all the answers, to have it together. And I remember being in a, in a Bible study one time and sharing, you know, about some struggles in my marriage. And I got a call the next day from a guy in the Bible study who said, I'm going to leave the church. And I said, how come? He goes, because you're struggling in your marriage. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I don't want to be, I don't want to have my pastor be someone who's struggling in their marriage. And what I realized was 
the like I you you want to be especially when you're in ministry and leadership you want to be authentic but people want you to some in some ways be better than you are and what I started to see and started to beat myself with Warwick was I started to realize I wasn't as good as I wanted to be or they wanted me to be and that was really lonely and and so I, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and and I couldn't sleep because I'd be angry at myself. I'd be disappointed with others, and I stopped sleeping through the night. Um, I would I would probably end up getting three or four hours of sleep, and now I was tired, and I was you know going through what in retrospect was burnout because I was working hard, but I started to feel like I'm a, I'm a failure. Uh, I'm, I'm not who people want me to be. I'm really not as spiritual as I want them to think I am. And now there's this gap between, you know, what I'm wanting and what I am. And that, that created a crucible season in my life where something needed to change. You know, I think people don't often realize how tough it is uh, to be a senior, a lead pastor because you want to model authenticity and vulnerability, but yet a lot of peop people in the congregations, they don't want that. They want you to be like Superman, the perfect marriage. Of course, the perfect kids goes without saying, you know, who never do dumb stuff and kids tend to do dumb stuff, but your kids aren't allowed to. Um, you've got to be spiritual and wise. And if somebody has a need, you meant to have this almost Moses-like uh, voice from the Lord that instantly calms the soul and solves the problem. I mean, they put you on this pedestal, and the sad thing is pastors are humans, and they have challenges in their lives and marriages and kids like anybody else, but, but yet you're not allowed to. That, I mean, that must create enormous stress in that I want to model authenticity, but like they don't want that. They want me to model perfection, and Mr. Super Spiritual Superman is kind of what they want, right? Well, and, and again, you know, what I felt like was lacking was the safe place to really share what was going on and f come back to hope. Um, and I would end up dumping on my wife things that almost like she would carry. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize is I was, I was almost, you know, creating this, this germ inside of her through my negativity and my complaining and my victimness. You know, like I think, you know, when we think of the hero, the hero is able to take what's happened to them and overcome it. I started to play the victim and I saw, I started to believe I was cursed. Um, that, that somehow all these terrible things that were happening to me and these people who didn't understand me were, were making me cursed. And it's when we get to the place where we're playing a victim, especially in leadership, that, you know, poor me, things have happened bad. Uh, that's where, you know, we, we're needing an, an something new. We need a breakthrough. We need new hope. And, uh, and so that's where I was uh, in, in my leadership. One of the things I think you're highlighting, Jeff, and I want listeners to understand that obviously, uh, you know, a lot of listeners won't be pastors or lead pastors, but they might be business executives. Um, and, you know, whatever position it is hard to find a safe place. I mean, I go to a, I don't know, 2000 odd non-denominational church. I've been an elder, you know, it's evangelical church. I've been an elder here for quite a lot of years. Um, and I, I get the fact that the lead pastor can't share with the elder boy, like I'm having struggled with my marriage. I sometimes wonder, is Jesus really real? You know, I mean, fleeting thoughts and I don't know, I just feeling uncertain and that's not, I don't care how wonderful the elders are, that's not a particularly safe place because you're going to go, oh my gosh, you know, who do we have as senior pastor? I mean, that's not, I don't care who they are, that's not a quote-unquote safe space, not because of the people, because of the context. So to have, whether it's a coach, mentors, uh, colleagues elsewhere, out of state, some safe place that's sorely needed, but most leaders they're lonely. They do not have that safe space. It's very, very rare. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, anybody that's a pastor or even a business executive, a CEO, VP, 
They can relate to your story. They've been there. It's like, I can't tell my boss I don't know what I'm doing. I can't tell my boss I'm thinking of quitting. I mean, really? You know, that's not a conversation you can have. It's not a safe place at all. So, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, I had I had two experiences that, that woke me up to this. One was where I was, uh, for the first time, meeting a, a CEO of a Fortune 500 corporation and beautiful big office overlooking Boston. And uh, we started to talk and share. And, and I think I was a little bit vulnerable with him. And he said, hey, could you close the door? And I said, sure. I got up, closed the door, I sat back down. He goes, I need to tell somebody this. And I haven't been able to tell anybody this. He said, you know, I've been having an affair for the last six months and it's eating me alive. And, mm. and I realized that, that here I was, this young guy, right. you know, totally new. And I was somebody he was telling someone as vulnerable as that. Uh, the second thing that happened was uh, a number of years later, I was, um, there was a guy who had been the, the, pre, the CEO of a major, another major corporation. And he, had, he was retiring, very famous CEO, very man, a man of faith. And uh, that we had a question and answer time. He was talking to pastors and business leaders and we did a, a gathering with him. And I asked a question at the end. I said, hey, if you were to do your, your business over again, what would you do differently? And he, he's because he had just retired. He looked down and then he looked up and tears were streaming down his face. He said, I'd have had a friend. I said, what mm. do you mean? He goes, I had nobody who, who I could share with. I had people on my board. I had people who were nonprofits who wanted money from me. I had people who I worked for me, but I didn't have anybody who I could share the real stuff with. And that was kind of a calling moment for me because uh, I realized that's what my dad didn't have. He didn't have anyone in his life who he could share the real stuff with. And so I think that's why he kind of bifurcated his life and his business. And that was when, for me, I was like, I would, I want to be that. I want to be that for leaders. And I want to help up raise up other people who can be that for leaders because that can change the story and change the story for them in their emotions, change the story in their relationships or in their moral issues. That's such a powerful point you just made. You wanted to be the friend and confident that your dad didn't have and that you, you didn't have at that point in your life uh, at the church. So I want to kind of shift from there, but talk about what was sort of the lowest moment when you were at the church that caused you to say, you know what, I have got to change directions here because this is just, maybe it wasn't destroying you, but it was it was not good for you. So we Talk about the lowest moment that, that caused you to say, I, I need to shift. This cannot continue. I, I can go back to it instantly. I know it, I know it in a heartbeat. <laughs> it's, uh, there was a leader who was part of our team who had moved from, from Chicago to Boston to be a part of our team. And uh, he called me to tell me that, that he and his wife were, had decided to move somewhere else and they were leaving. And I think I put a lot of hope in him being a part of things. And I'd already been feeling alone in, in this. And when he told me he was leaving, I tried to keep a smile on my face and go, you know, hey, if God's leading you elsewhere and gave him all the good God talk, I hung up the phone and I picked up this 25 pound thing called a concordance, okay, which is a big book at the time before things were online. I held it above my head and I threw it across the room, breaking the book, breaking the wall and started just yelling, I hate my life. I hate my job. I hate leadership. I hate the church. I mean, I just lost it. And my wife walked in at the moment and just looked at me with just sheer terror. Okay. Mm. <laughs> and, right. and she's like, you have lost it. And I, I knew at that point that I couldn't just keep doing what I was doing, hoping for different results. And in, in a nutshell, I ended up getting in my car, taking every journal I'd ever written, driving to Vermont, driving to New Hampshire, and just getting away to the mountains, which has now influenced my, my own passion to have leaders get away to the mountains. But it restored my soul. 
I started realizing I needed silence and solitude and I needed to get away and I needed to have the time and the opportunity to reconsider my own life. But it was because I had flamed out. I mean, I, I was I was violent. I, I mean, I, I would have I would have hit somebody had they come in, you know, wasn't my wife standing there. So, this is an interesting opportunity, Jeff, because um, we talk about it all the time at Beyond the Crucible and at Crucible Leadership in general. Um, and, and we say it a lot and, and we don't really unpack it all that often. And this is a great pivot point where we can unpack it. We say your crucible experience can change the trajectory of your life, but it doesn't have to be the end of your story. If you learn the lessons of your crucible and move forward, it can be the beginning of a new story that leads to a life of significance. That's where we are in your story right now. Your crucible's there. You've got your journals. You're driving to Vermont. You're driving to places. What was the lessons? Can you touch on a couple of the lessons and how those lessons came to you that led you back from the pit of your crucible at its most um, explosive to then the path that you're on now? What was the first kind of learnings that sort of came to you as you got away? Yeah, as, as leaders, most of us become too busy to care for our own souls and invest in our own, you know, what I call soul care. Uh, when I, when I, I ended up in this little town in, in New Hampshire, went into a bookstore, one of those bookstores that had about 80 books, you know, it wasn't Barnes and Noble. <laughs> And there was a book there by an author that someone had mentioned to me, a guy named Henry Nowen, who was a, a priest. And the book was called The Life of the Beloved. I took the book off, started to read it there, and I bought the book, went to a coffee shop and read it front to, you know, front to back. And the whole concept of the book was that, that we are truly loved not because of what we do, not because of our family name, not because of the family business, not because of how much money we, we've made, that in our true identity, we are someone who is loved, loved by God, and we're lovable. And, and what, I've, what I've come to see is that that is the foundation of everything. Because, I mean, I've worked with millionaires, billionaires, uh, it doesn't matter how much money you have, we still have to go, am I, do, am I important? Do I really matter? What's my identity? Uh, it could be somebody who's an entrepreneur, uh, you know, they, they, they want to succeed, but it, it has to start with, I don't need to prove myself. I am loved. And that, that one concept is, is truly a transformational concept, mm. and we need to take it from our head to our heart. And that began a journey for me to go, how do I keep coming back to that as, as who I am? instead of what I prove, what I do, what I earn. And so identity matters. That's awesome. I mean, we talk a lot about identity and that's <clears throat> something worth dwelling on. I think one of the other things we talk about that Gary says, you know, when you're in the pit, there's typically two choices. You can hide under the covers and be angry and bitter uh, for the next 30, 40, 50 years, life ends for all of us. And th you could have done that saying, I'm awful, I hate my life, I'm just going to keep throwing concordances at the wall, yelling <laughs> at everybody, it's probably not going to be good for my marriage, but I don't care, I'm just angry, there's no solutions, I'm just going to keep yelling and getting angry and being frustrated. Sadly, we all know people who've taken that path, and you could have, but you chose not to. You chose, whether it's through your own inner conviction, your wife saying, you know, buddy, I think you you need some help here, or something needs to change. In the both of you, didn't sound like you needed encouraging, but you made a choice to go and seek some solitude to say, "Okay, Lord, you know what next? Why did you choose the path of I got to figure this out and change my life rather than I'm just going to be angry and bitter forever?" Because not everybody chose your that your path. Why did you choose that path? I, I can't help but thinking of a cartoon I saw recently where there's a monster walking into the room and there's someone under the covers and the monster goes, oh, nuts, they're under the covers. I can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think there's, yeah. this, there's this part right. of us that wants to just hide under the covers when, when there's something wrong inside of us. And I think it can be physical. It can be emotional. It can be relational. Sometimes it comes from, you know, breakdown in a marriage 
where there's like, there's something that's wrong. And so like a, a good doctor knows that you've got to start with diagnosis. You know, you've got to get to what's really going on. And to do that, you need space. I mean, so my wife and I are creating this, this 26 acres in Boulder, Colorado to give leaders space, not for information, but to process. Uh, my wife was talking at a, a summit, a Q conference a few years ago, and she said, there's a difference between the transfer of information and transformation. And I think what, what a lot of us have realized is information is great, but it's not enough. We need, we need practices. We need things that are going to bring us back to life. And in, in the book of John, Jesus uh, said, you know, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. And so when, when we start to go, hey, you know, that, that's a great concept, but if our life doesn't feel abundant, are we doing something to change that? And, and that's where I've come to believe that certain habits, certain practices that are both spiritual as well as, you know, just life good habits can, can bring and breathe life back into us. And so they've become what I call my habits of hope. Uh, because I, I know that I'm just that far away, like an alcoholic, back into the guy who's going to throw the books across the room, you know, shout my life stinks, and, uh, and go back there. And, and so practices make all the difference. Yeah, and I want to get into that habits of hope. I love that word practices. But just before we do, you're in this, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, you're with the, having some solitude. What were some of those first inklings? that began to shift you to doing what you do now with We Train Coaches and Habits of Hope and the Soul Care Ranch. What were some of those, there was, maybe it's an epiphany, but there were some inklings that led you to where you are now. What were some of those first inklings you were getting as you were in solitude? Yeah, it, it took a while, but that, that solitude was life-giving. I mean, first, I just, I came back a different person. One of the things that happened when I was there was my, my first real girlfriend passed away when, when she was 19 and I was 18. And I went to her grave. I, never, I hadn't been there since she died. And, and I, as I was staring at her grave, I saw this old couple, you know, um, pull up and go up to this tombstone. And I sat there just watching them and thinking, you know, they're, they're gonna be here soon. And, and my friend Cindy is no longer alive. It was almost like seeing death that made me go, Jeff, do you wanna live or do you wanna die? Or are you ready to engage life? And so I, th I think we've all gotta make that, do I really wanna live decision? And, and am I really living now? And I, I realized I wasn't living. But, um, but I, I did, one of the things that did, God brought into my life uh, coaches, one of whom uh, was a mentor consultant who I still meet with, met with him this week. His name is Bob Beal. And, uh, and Bob, as I was meeting with Bob and he became that safe place, I looked at him and I thought, man, I wish my dad had this. And man, I wish so many other leaders had what he's bringing to me. And I thought, how can I do what he's doing? And certainly it's not for everybody, but I've come to believe that if there could be spiritually minded, great coaches for leaders that could help leaders have the safe place, have them find their story or change their story, that could be something that I could give my life to. And that began a journey for me of how do I learn to coach? How do I become a coach? And how can I bring coaching to others in the way that Bob has done that for me? And that's so profound. I think what you're saying, what we've said is you wanted to become the person that you needed and your dad needed. That was maybe, you know, uh, you said earlier, what's the thing that you feel like it, it really bugs me, it angers me that th there's not enough of X. Well, X for you is being the coach that you needed and your dad needed. And that was maybe your, some people have called it your holy discontent. Um, you know, uh, that felt like that was for you. And I, I love all the things that you do. I mean, there's so many, you mentioned before what you and your wife do is Soul Care Ranch. That sounds like it's replicating to a degree what you had 
in Vermont in those days, probably, you know, more, better, if you will. It probably includes coaches and mentors, places for you. So talk a bit about Soul Care Ranch. It sounds like the genesis of it was at that time in Vermont, but it's more than that. It's more than just solitude, right? That's So talk a bit about what you do at the yeah. Soul Care Ranch. Well, you know, I think we, we, we all love content, right? I'm, I'm a content junkie. We love conferences. But I, I, what we came to believe is there needs to be space for transformation, for people to get away and be in nature because nature breathes life. The mountains, you know, of Colorado are absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. um, but but they need to then be able to spend time processing on some of the bigger questions. What, you know, where do I need healing? What do I need to avoid? What, what is the vision that is really my vision? And, and so we, we've, we've been creating and raising up spiritual directors and coaches who can work with leaders and then have the space and time for it. And, and it's kind of like, you know, a lot of people go on vacation and vacation is awesome, but this is kind of like a vacation for the leader's soul, you know, where you mm -hmm. get away and you create the space to meet with a coach, but also to meet with God, to meet with yourself and it not be rushed because, you know, busyness and rush is, you know, destroying too many good things. So what if there's this place that brings leaders to life? And that's what we've we've been you know creating in the last uh, couple of years, and uh, it's it's just been life giving even for Mindy and I to give and create what we wished we'd had. You know, there's a line you mentioned I think before we were on air, um, and this is true probably for people in ministry and nonprofits that they're running around trying to care for other people's souls. And I think he said, "Well, I needed." somebody to help me care for my soul or something to that effect. I think that's just so profound because leaders, even in businesses, I mean, more enlightened leaders realize they need to treasure their employees. You don't achieve profitable results without a great team. And so a lot of leaders, well-meaning leaders are pouring out, pouring out, but nobody's pouring into them. They're not caring for themselves. I think elsewhere you talked about elite athletes and you got to take care of your body if you're an elite athlete. Well, if you're elite, you got to care for your soul. So just talk about that concept. I think it's really profound. You know, you pour and pour out caring for others, but yet you got to care for yourself, which is not selfish. You can't care for anybody else unless you start caring for yourself. So talk about how do you look at that? What's your sort of philosophy? Yeah, I, I remember as a, as a CEO, my dad used to go once a year and get this big checkup you know, where we go and, and have, you know, somebody look at all different different elements of his physical mm -hmm. body. And uh, I think that's really significant. We all, we all need that. But, uh, but I also think, you know, we need times to get away and get a checkup of, of, our, of our deeper selves, our, our emotions, uh, our, our purpose. Are we, are we doing the right thing? Are we going in the right direction? Our identity, um, our, our soul. And, and I think that, you know, if, if I was to wish something, I would wish there could be an army of, call them coaches, who would bring that kind of surgeon general for the soul type of approach to help leaders. Because I mean, I some, some of my mentors, and, and maybe you know who these people are, uh, Gary and, and Warwick, is they've, they've become, you know, tabloid of what their failures are, their moral failures. And these are good people who, who went down paths that they didn't plan on going. And what I've found in coaching is I feel like I, because I've been that safe place, I feel like I've, I've worked with some leaders and helped them avoid it just because I asked them the questions. I just, I asked them like, Hey, you know, right now, one to 10, how are you doing personally? one to 10, how are you doing morally? And, and they felt like, and they knew that I, I wouldn't share what they were really telling me, but you know, there, there are a lot of times, Oh, I'm a nine, I'm a 10. And then every once in a while I was like, I'm a two. All right. Do you want to talk about it? You know? And, uh, and so I feel like if we could have that for leaders as a way of a way of their regular life, no matter where you are in leadership, if you're a young leader, especially, 
having where you get away where somebody's going to help get into the deeper parts and then you meet with those people maybe once a month or twice a month over the year to stay on track like what could happen you know yeah i mean that's awesome i mean having that safe place where you really can talk about these things and um so okay i i love the concept you have sort of in habits of hope and it's like if you want to stay um it's funny it's sort of being in the back of my mind about some of these things even before we spoke but you know if everybody these days they want to eat right um, avoid junk food they want to be healthy exercise you know um, stretch uh, you know cardio everybody knows that makes sense but people don't tend to think about well what does that look like for the soul for the inner being very few people do that. And so Habits of Hope. So talk about, I know there's a lot of stuff in there, but talk about what are the key concepts you would say and if you need to be physically fit to, you know, really do anything, what does it mean to have a, a fit soul, if you will? You know, what are some of those Habits of Hope that, um, uh, you know, because you can't go on a retreat every week. You know, what are some of those Habits of Hope that help sustain your soul so that you don't go to a retreat and say, where are you morally, ethically, marriage? And it's like, oh, I'm a one, one, one on every, you know. Ideally, you know, a retreat is good, but you don't want to, you can't rely on that as the whole solution, obviously, uh, which I'm sure you tell folks. So what are some of those key habits of hope that sustains you day in, day out and sustains your soul? Yeah, well, one of the most encouraging things that I think has come out of neuroscience in the last number of years is that our brains can change. We're not stuck mm -hmm. with the brain we, we, we inherited or grew up with or we had 10 years ago. There's a thing called neuroplasticity, which means that you can create new neural pathways in your brain. Uh, in the Bible in Romans, it talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind and, and that we can become better, healthier, happier, joyful, hope-filled people. And so what are the practices that do that? And, and one of them is just so simple that it's almost crazy simple. It's just you, you take the time each day to literally in your mind think, what am I grateful for? Mm. What, 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 do, what, what in my life is good? Because I could, I could paint a picture and you could feel really bad for me with things that are bad. Or I could say, hey, let me tell you about the things that I'm grateful for. So every single morning before I, after I have my coffee, I, I actually list out things that I'm grateful for. And there's, you know, they could be Barney, my dog. They could be, I get to live in Colorado. Uh, they can be, hey, I mean, literally this morning, it was that I was going to be on, on this podcast. Uh, and so by having those habits where you see you're blessed instead of cursed, you start to, your mind starts to believe it. And ultimately we really are blessed, but the victim part of us says, I'm cursed, I'm broken, my life stinks. Um, you know, I, I, could, I could tell you stories of things that have happened in the last two weeks that, that, that are hard, but the hero focuses on how am I being transformed in order to live into my better story. And so I know I have a better story, but I've got to practice the things each day that bring me back to the better story. You know, and I, let's, I want listen. Please go ahead, Gary. Well, I want to make sure that listeners get that. I was going to do the same thing, Warren. I want to make sure <laughs> listeners understand no the application to themselves. And that is, it is true, is it not, that no matter how bad your crucible is, no matter how rough your circumstances, even you standing by the wall with an exhaustive concordance that weighed 25 pounds, ready to hurl it into the, the wood or the plaster or whatever it was, even you, if you would have taken time instead to focus on gratitude, would have had things to, be, to, to enumerate that, you're, that you had gratitude for. Is it true that all of us, regardless of our circumstances, can find, if we look hard enough, and it's not that hard sometimes, things to be grateful for. Yeah, any great, any great fiction writer knows, and I've learned this from great fiction writers is that like what they do is they, they 
they bring about certain circumstances that their characters need to respond to. And, and how their character responds is what makes a great story. And so mm. in all of our lives, we're gonna get faced with, I mean, we just had a huge fire come through Colorado. We get faced with these circumstances. Now, how will we respond? We can respond with, I'm cursed, I'm a victim, and I'm even a villain because I'm gonna get you for it. Or I can respond with, man, I, I get to live into this adventure. I look at how many things I still have going right. And, and I believe that God ultimately has things in his hands. That's my where my faith comes in, that God cares about me in the midst of this, that God loves me in the midst of this. That's where I feel like there's the biggest hope. And, and so the habits of hope are practicing the things that bring me back to that way of thinking. Yeah, I mean, that's so profound what you're sharing, Jeff. I mean, I totally agree and concur. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, every day I have my practices, probably not that different than yours. Um, uh, daily uh, Bible study and reflection, you know, my church, actually every year our pastor puts out the a chapter a day book in which there's a lot of different ways of going through the Bible, but it's just, you know, it's right there for everybody in the church. We, you know, pick it up at the first few days of the year and kind of off we go. So that's sort of part of that. But also, I do reflect, I think it's almost like breathing for me or just a habit. I am, I, I look back, I could look back and say, gosh, I lost this two billion plus family business and it, et cetera. But I look back and say, you know, very similar to you, I've been married almost within a year, the same length of time. And I just say, thank you, Jesus, that um, he brought, you know, we've been you know, married at 89, whatever that is, about 32 years. It was all the Lord. It's a subject for another podcast, but it was definitely, I felt like the Lord telling me, this is the one I'd have for you in life. I was 100% certain. I checked it with some guy, brothers who are believers and, you know, all the rest of it as you should, anything like that. But as the decades have worn by, I felt that was clearly the Lord. I'm so blessed. Three wonderful kids. I love what I do in Christian leadership. We have a great team. I get to hear people's stories such as yourself. I mean, I'm I'm so blessed. You know, the Lord has provided us financially way more than we need. I mean, yeah, there are challenges, but I look at all of those things and I just say, as a person of faith, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, pretty much every day and the more you do, it's like the gratitude almost uh, increases. It just You get to be just so, so you know, focusing on, on gratitude and having those spiritual disciplines you know if you're a person of faith read the bible if you're not a person of faith find whatever anchor for your soul is i mean at least for me there are these a type people that you know go a million miles an hour that tends not to be my rhythm i'm a reflective person so i know if i don't take space to just be and not run around like a crazy person my writing will suffer my thinking will suffer my interviews on podcasts will suffer so you know I try not to go too far, too fast if I don't have to, you know, and just say, okay, Lord, you're in control. It's not about achieving some big result. I just want to be faithful. And I don't know, I don't know if any of that makes sense, but I'm a huge believer in those habits help provide fulfilling life. If you, you know, so it's, it's huge. I really hope listeners hear what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, just any reflections you want to add on, on habits, because it's a massive subject, obviously, and really important. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I would just say, you know, there there needs to be a paying attention to when, what are you doing when you're neglecting your soul and what are the mm -hmm. symptoms? Like when you're neglecting, you know, is it anger? Is it victimhood? Is it discouragement? Is it depression? Uh, and then when you do those things, note the difference when you spend time taking a walk breathing just simply like you know 10 times a day just take a deep breath and think of something you're grateful for it could be something as simple as that uh, and going back to that scripture i quoted the uh, in john 10 10 the thief comes to steal kill and destroy um, whether it's whether you believe there's a spiritual principle out there or a spiritual person out there that's seeking to take that from you or you you just are doing it yourself what is stealing, killing, and destroying? And, and then what will you do to fight against that? 
Uh, I mean, because you can build all the strategies and get all the education and knowledge, but it, but if you're not doing the daily practices that keep that uh, stealing, killing, and destroying from happening, and instead breathing life back into you, um, you're you're missing all that you're going to bring through your presence. I mean, you probably heard, you know, your greatest present is your presence, and for leaders, your greatest presence is your presence present as your presence. Uh, because, you know, if, if you're not fully there, everybody suffers. Uh, the people who work for you, with you, or, uh, or even the coaches who coach you. Yeah, I think and it's so good. Of, I think, I'll try, let, let me just say one, okay. one, 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 one point here. Um, Cause I know uh, as we're kind of summing up, um, you know, what is, I think another aspect of habits of hope or soul care, I think, listeners should consider, I think we're touching on this, you know, if you have a splitting migraine and a few days go by, you're not going to ignore it. You're going to go to the, the doctor and figure it out, right? Because if you ignore it, it, it might be something really bad that could have been uh, solved a lot sooner. I think it's the same with the soul, you know. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I do my daily Bible reading. I'm grateful. You know, I, I pray. But like being human, there are times in which I get angry or frustrated about things, and sometimes I don't know what it is. So I'll think and pray about it. Often I'll say to my wife, who knows me well, like, I'm angry about something. I don't know what it is. Help me figure it out. And typically, you know, we'll figure it out, and then, okay, so what do I do about it? Do I need to talk to somebody? Do I need to pray? You know, what, how do I, so when you have those early warning signs of anger, frustration, don't stuff it. Deal with it figure it out. If you have a coach or a mentor, perfect. I'm feeling annoyed about something. I'm not know what it is. Help me figure it out. Those to me is, is also part of, at least from my perspective, maybe it's not habits of hope, but soul care in that when you have those early warning signs, don't wait till a crisis happens. Deal with it. I mean, the, the tools you've mentioned, Jeff, provide outlets for that. You've got a soul care retreat. You've got mentors, you've got friends, you've got coaches. <clears throat> there are people who can help you get in touch with what that anger and frustration is, and you can deal with it before the whole ember turns into a massive forest fire and your house burns down. Does that, as we close, and because uh, the time is getting on, does that make sense, just that early warning system? Yeah, and, and it, it's not weakness to need to surround yourself with, with people and processes that can help. It's actually wisdom, it's strength to know that you need you know others in your life who are gonna ask those questions or coach you, or you need practices and you need the time to do that. So I would say, you know, if, if you see some of those symptoms, don't just ignore them, do something proactive to, to get to the place where you're thriving because you thriving is what the world needs. Well said. Speaking of, of practices that are necessary, the captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign indicating that it's uh, getting to the time that we're going to need to land the plane here in our uh, very interesting conversation uh, on Beyond the Crucible with Jeff uh, Caliguire. Jeff, before we do that, though, and Warwick asks you another question, I would be remiss if I did not ask you um, on behalf of our listeners, how can they find out more about you? How can they find you on the internet? So you may be listening to this and thinking, man, I would love to, to be that kind of coach because I'm trying to raise up and, and train coaches who are spiritual leaders. I believe coaches can be those spiritual leaders. And if that's intriguing to you, go to wetraincoaches.com and then, and then there's an assessment there called is coaching for me. And, and there's also people who may be going, how do I bring a coaching approach to transform my culture and, a, you know, bring that kind. That's also something that we work with, with leaders who are wanting to say, how do we bring that into a culture by raising up leaders who think like a coach and, and raise up others uh, in a coaching manner. So we train coaches.com. My wife's website is soulcare.com and, and there's tools there for those who are going, hey, how do I how do I go deeper in in my own spiritual practices? Um, the book, The Habits of Hope, probably the best place I just say go to thehabitsofhope.com and you can order it there. There it right is. Right here, here it is, right there. So Warwick, the final question is yours. 
Well, thank you, Jeff, for being here. I mean, it's just so encouraging soul care and habits of hope and surrounding yourself with people that can really be a sounding board and really a safe place. As we sum up, what would you say is kind of um, a key message of hope that if you forget everything else, what is the most important thing you want listeners to take away from our discussion today? Uh, hope hope can be grown. It, it really is like a muscle uh, that that just, just because you're not, if you were to say where you are personally or where you are in hope right now and you're a six or a five or something, uh, I really believe that hope can get to a whole new place, but just be intentional and go, if, if you are a person that has an amazing hope, what will that do? And, and what journey will you go on to grow your hope intentionally? I've been in the communications business long enough to know and the last word on the subject's been spoken and Jeff has spoken it. The captain has indeed put the plane on the ground. Um, listener, I have a few uh, notes I've been taking as Jeff and Warwick have been talking that um, some, some sort of key takeaways that uh, can help you as you uh, embark on your own life of significance. And the first one of that, one of the first things Jeff said that really, really struck me was find your deep gladness and apply it to the world's deep need. I'll say that again so you get it. Find your deep gladness and apply it to the world's deep need. That's a recipe for what we call a life of significance. Um, describe, you know, we say it's crafting a vision rooted in your gifts and passions and living out of these things to live a life on purpose to serve others. That's how we express it. Uh, and for help in discovering your deep gladness, as Jeff calls it, and your life's vision, as Warwick calls it, you can visit our website crucibleleadership.com and there you can take our free life of significance assessment. Discover, are you a world changer? Are you a star performer? Are you an Imagineer? Take the assessment at crucibleleadership.com and find out. Second takeaway from Jeff, beware victimhood. That's a good one. Uh, when Jeff started to view his frustration and depression as a pastor as the fact that he was a victim, that's when his crucible really went uh, deeper and darker. Uh, your discontent is a sign, but not of the fact that you're a victim. It's a sign that you need to discover a path forward in line with your gifts and your passions. And the third takeaway is what we sort of ended our conversation on today. And I'm going to use the exact words that Jeff used when we asked him uh, in a, in a pre-interview questionnaire, what's a critical action you believe listeners can take to find hope and healing after a setback? This is what Jeff wrote. Make gratitude your way of life. Write it, breathe and focus on something to be grateful for multiple times each day. Multiple times each day, plug into gratitude and that can change your perspective and pretty soon change your circumstances. Listeners, thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, until we're together next time, please remember this, that your crucible experiences, we know, we heard some from Jeff, we've heard Warwick's before, you heard mine um, a couple weeks ago on this show. Crucible experiences are difficult. They can knock the wind out of your sails. They can knock the air out of your lungs. They can change the, tra the trajectory of your life, but they're not the end of your story. In fact, if you take the lessons of those and you learn the lessons of those crucible experiences as Jeff did, as Warwick did, as I've done, and you move forward beyond your crucible, your story can move into its greatest place ever. The greatest story of your life can be the next story of your life because that story leads to a life of significance. Mm -hmm.